Well, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. Glad that you're here this morning. As we begin our time together, uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, we have our, our students who are heading to, to Chicago um, following, I believe, either the 945 or the 11 o'clock service. I'm not entirely sure which one, but they're, they're heading out today. And in your worship guide, there are a number of things that uh, Chris has asked you to pray for this week. And uh, so I would encourage you to, to do that. They're going to be stopping overnight uh, in Metropolis, Illinois, which is uh, the home of Reagan, uh, one of our interns, um, and uh, the church that we've partnered with. They, they've sent several interns uh, to us over the years, uh, but they're going to be stopping there, and then they'll, they'll head the rest of the way uh, tomorrow. And so they'll be working with some churches in the Chicago area, and would encourage you to, to be praying for these things that, that Chris has asked for uh, specifically. On Friday, August the 4th, we have our, our teachers' luncheon for uh, Chickamauga City Schools, and uh, one of the things that they're asking for uh, is desserts. Some of you make tremendous, tremendous desserts, and uh, if you would provide uh, one of those for that event, you can contact Norma McDaniel. Her number and information is in the worship guide. Um, and then also, um, we, we try to provide supplies for the teachers. And, and so if you'd like to make a donation towards that, uh, you can contact Debbie Gossett, who is our financial secretary. Um, and then next Sunday is uh, July the 30th, which is the fifth Sunday of July. And if you remember, uh, several months back, we talked about on the fifth Sundays, when, when on the, a couple times a year when that happens, uh, that we'll have the children worship with us. There won't be children's church on those Sundays. And so next Sunday, uh, there will not be children's church. All of the children who would normally be in children's church will be in here. Um, and so if you have a child that's in that age group, uh, really three years old and up, uh, we'll still have nursery, but three years old and up uh, will be in the service with us. And that is a good and healthy thing. Uh, for us as a church family. So, so be thinking about that if you have children in that age group. We're going to begin our time of worship with our monthly memory verse, which is going to be on the screen, uh, Psalm 9-1, if you would read this with me. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. Let's pray together. God, as we begin our time, um, we pray for these, these students college students and adults who are heading to uh, Chicago. Um, God, we pray that they would have gospel opportunities, that they would uh, interact with people um, in the areas that they are, they are serving, and, and they uh, will be bold in their, uh, their gospel proclamation, that they would uh, be willing to uh, talk about sin and talk about judgment and redemption and forgiveness. Uh, God, we, we pray for the churches that, that they're going to be interacting with, that they're going to be working for. We pray for their ministries that will continue long after our group leaves. Uh, we pray for the, uh, the men who lead those churches, for the, the people who serve in those churches. Uh, God, that they um, would have a, a vision and a, a clear mission to, to reach people and, and that you would um, do a radical work in, in that city that we can be a part of and, and of course we pray for those same things here in Chickamauga uh, God, that we, we would be a, a church that, that is reaching people with the gospel um, meeting real needs um, and, and, it, and it's all for your glory it's, it's not so that we have a name or, or a church's names in the headlines it is because we want to be a faithful church that is about the gospel and about sound doctrine and about serving people and God I pray that um, that would be our heartbeat and, and that we would be motivated and eager to do the work of ministry because uh, each of us in this room who profess Jesus um, we, we are a minister we are a servant um, who you have designed to be the vehicle by which the gospel goes out to our community God, we give you this time uh, as, as a response, as an offering of, of gratitude, of worship. 
is just so unbelievably uh, good to us. Um, God, may we, may we honor you uh, with our voices and, and with our uh, desire to take in the word and to apply it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father God, we thank you for the love that you've had for us. The love that did not leave us where we were, but instead pursued us in our sin and desperation. God, you planned a rescue mission through your son that was the provision of our hope. And God, this morning we come resting in that hope, celebrating that hope, worshiping you because of that hope that you provided to us. Father, as we have sung songs of praise, we pray that they were an offering, uh, a, a sweet-smelling incense for you. And Lord, as now we study from your word, God, we pray that you write upon our hearts and challenge our lives to be different, to help us look more and more like your son every day. God, we ask your blessings upon us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. We are back in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 20. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 28. If you want to find your way in your Bible, in your text, in your passage over to there. <coughs> this morning, we're going to be looking at uh, a passage that I, I'm quite fond of. Uh, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Three of them are known as the Synoptic Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're Synoptic Gospels because they share a similar source. They share the exact same uh, storylines. However, they have slightly different details in them. And so we're going to overlap some of those passages today. <coughs> but uh, we're going to start out with this question. Have you ever wanted to be the best at something? Ever wanted to be the, the, the greatest? There's been lots of times in my life where I've wanted to, to be the best at something. Uh, and I, as I've gotten older, I've just simply come to the, the humble understanding that um, I'm probably never going to be the best at anything. And that's okay. That's okay. You know, there's, there's those who uh, strive and work hard to be the best. There's, you know, there's those who uh, argue about who the best golfer of all time is or the, the greatest basketball player of all time. And, and they have these different debates. But if you've ever wanted to be the greatest at something, that's a... That's a normal notion. That's a normal thought. It's a normal tendency to think that way. There's something inherent about human beings that we often want to be the greatest. I was actually recently talking with my son, Aiden, and uh, he says, Dad, I want you to put me on a, on a training program that just makes me huge. I was like, well, how big do you want to? And so he, he shows me like a version of somebody, and it's like one of these people that are just like, like massive, like, like muscles spilling out. And I'm like, Dude, that's gross looking. You don't want to be. He's like, no, I want to be the, the strongest. I'm like, you're nuts. But we get this notion in our minds sometimes of wanting to, to be the greatest. And uh, in this passage, we're going to find the, the disciples once again coming to Jesus with this question about, about being great, about being in a position of prominence. And they, they come kind of almost with an immaturity. But don't judge them too harshly or too quickly because we often approach God in the exact same way. So what we see, though, is these disciples having this conversation. But if we remember back to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 4, Jesus had already instructed them on what it would mean to be the greatest in the kingdom. He says, therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child or like these little ones will be the great ones in the kingdom of heaven. It says the great ones are like children, which is a paradox to their mind. They don't grasp or comprehend this, but Jesus has addressed this. And However, we find ourselves again today in this passage <coughs> where the disciples <coughs> are asking about being the greatest. They wanted to be important. They wanted to, to be in a position of authority. And Jesus was about to tell them the only means by which you can achieve that aspiration is not on the path that you think that it is. And so we're going to immerse ourselves in this discussion of, you know, greatness. And then what's interesting is Jesus is sandwiching this entire discussion between further predictions of his own death. Further predictions of his own death. It's kind of like, have you ever been in a conversation? I, I think this happens with, with spouses a lot. You're in a conversation with your spouse and you're telling all these different details and things and like they miss one key thing that you said and so it confuses the entire conversation because one key thing was missed in the conversation. Well, it's like the disciples are missing this one key thing. It's the prediction of Jesus' death. He does it twice in this particular passage and he, but he's already done this numerous times throughout the gospel where he's spoken of his death that is, that is coming and it's like they, they just keep missing it. And so this is... This is convicting and challenging for Jesus' followers, and it's convicting and challenging for us. So if you join me in Matthew chapter 20, we're going to start in verse 17. And Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem. He took the twelve disciples aside by themselves on the way up, and he said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, 
and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, <clears throat> he will be raised up. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down, making a request of him. And he said, <clears throat> and he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit at my right and my left, this is not mine to give, for it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself, and he said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them? It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. It's a powerful passage where Jesus brings about some correction in their understanding and some instruction for us on how we ought to conduct ourselves living in this world. The apostles were making their way up to Jerusalem. Jesus will eventually be crucified. This is the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of the end of the culmination of God's rescue plan for humanity. So before we get to our first point, I want to just address something that, it, that it could have been a point, but, uh, but anyhow, in verse 17, it says, as Jesus was about to go to Jerusalem, he takes them aside. And he's going to describe for them once again what's going to happen in his death. He's going to once again give the prediction of his death. But what we see very first is that, that Jesus had his eyes set on the task. He is headed towards Jerusalem. In the other synoptic gospels, in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 32 through 45, it is this parallel passage. And it says that they were headed up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem would have been a, a, a place of higher elevation. And so these disciples and Jesus are following up to Jerusalem, and they're following Jesus, who is steadfast, making his journey to Jerusalem. But uh, along the way, at some point, Jesus stops and brings them around and tells them why they're going to Jerusalem. Well, in the, in the book of Mark, it actually adds a, a, a further explanation where Jesus says, and, you know, as he's having this conversation with the disciples, it says, and the disciples were astonished and afraid. Why on earth would they are headed to Jerusalem and they're with Jesus? Why would they be astonished and afraid? Well, I can tell you it's because they'd already been to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they faced severe and harsh persecution, conflict with the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they, they have already recognized that there's great difficulty in Jerusalem. And yet Jesus is steadfast with his eyes set towards Jerusalem. And he's walking along that way and they're following along behind him. So what we ought to, from the outset, understand is, is Jesus is seeking to accomplish the mission that he's been given by God. His eyes are set on the task before him. And we, too, must set our eyes on the task that is for us. We must begin to see like Christ, see like Jesus. Now, this is a hard thing to do because there are so many distractions around us, are there not? I, I, I tell you what, I, I love to cook, as many of you know, and uh, one of the things that, that cooking requires is, as you become, you know, enthralled with it, is you have lots of ingredients. And uh, oftentimes when I'm preparing to cook something, I want to make sure that I have all of the ingredients that I need. And so I'll open the refrigerator door and I'll be searching through and looking through the entire refrigerator and, and writing down my list of things that I need. Um, well, for whatever reason, I, I can't seem to be able to see very well when I'm looking through the refrigerator and all the condiments because uh, I seem to forget that I had already bought, you know, a bottle of soy sauce four times. And so I have like four bottles of soy sauce in the fridge and half the time I'll buy another one because, you know, I look in the fridge. I'm looking right in front of me. I'm looking in the fridge. And for whatever reason, I don't see what is right in front of me. Oftentimes, I, I think we don't see what's right in front of us. We, we know what the truth is. We know what, what the reality is, but we don't see what is right in front of us. And Jesus sees what is right in front of him. And praise be to God that he did see because his task was before him to go for us and to suffer and atone for our sin. 
to take on the, upon the, the wrath of God. So before we even dive into the main points of this particular passage, I wanted us to grasp that fact that we must see like Christ, having a, a vision that is set on the task that is before us. And the task that is before us, it, it's not actually all that complicated. Jesus lays it out pretty simply throughout the gospel. But our first point this morning is this, is that we are to suffer like Christ. Suffer like Christ. And the question is, um, what does it mean to suffer? What, what truly is suffering? How do we measure what suffering is? Is it something that is slightly uncomfortable? Is it something that is annoying? What, what truly is suffering? We must measure that in our minds. If we're to suffer like Christ, we, we must consider that. What does it mean to suffer? <clears throat> I like most music. Like, I like country music. I like hip-hop music. I, I like rock music. Um, I like Celtic bagpipes. I like um, opera music. I, li I like a full spectrum of music. But there's one type of music that I absolutely cannot stand. It's that, uh, like the heavy metal screamo music where they're just like, ah! I can't, can't do it. Can't, can't. Makes me want to, you know, rip my ears off. You know, it's, it's horrendous. But is listening to that, is that really suffering? Like if I'm in the back room of the gym and somebody's playing that music, is that really, is that really suffering? Well, my answer to that is no. It's annoying, but it's not truly suffering. Suffering means that we are taking on something upon ourselves that is, that is, that is more than just uncomfortable. No, it requires a sacrifice. The suffering that Jesus took upon himself was not only the physical brutality of the cross, the suffering that Jesus also took upon himself was the very wrath of God. He took upon himself our sin. He exchanged his righteousness for our unrighteousness. And God poured out his wrath upon him. And so this is what suffering looks like. Jesus, in two other places, has already given the prediction of his death explicitly two times. And this is the third prediction of his death. <clears throat> he says he's going up to Jerusalem, and he, he walks it out. And the Son of Man, that is a messianic term, if you're not familiar, the Son of Man, that's why it's capitalized, will be delivered. And he speaks of himself in the third person. I, I, would, I would speak about, you know, Sean's going up to, but, but he does in the third person in this passage. And he says, look, we're going up to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be delivered to the chief priests, the scribes. Okay, so he's going to be delivered to them, step one. Step two, they're going to condemn him to death. That's step two. Step three, and they're going to hand him over to the Gentiles, the Roman officials, the Roman authorities of the time. All right, and then they're going to mock, scourge, crucify him. That's the next step. And then finally, though, praise be to God, it does not end there, because three days later, he will rise up. Three days later, he's coming out of the grave. And this is the, the victory that is coming, but this is the third prediction of his death. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the, 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 the Son of Man, came to suffer. Jesus' mission included suffering. God's plan for Jesus included suffering. If we're to be like Jesus, we must come to the realization that at certain points in our life, God's plan is for you to suffer. Doesn't that just give you the warm fuzzies on a nice Sunday morning? Part of God's plan will include suffering. And Jesus knows that it's coming, and he willingly takes it upon himself. Like I said, he heads steadfast straight towards Jerusalem, knowing what is right ahead of him, knowing what is coming, knowing the brutality of what is to come. <clears throat> Each time Jesus predicts his death, he gives a little bit more information about how it's going to happen. And when we put it all together, we see the graphic and horrific nature of what Jesus is predicting, what he is headed towards. And as most of us know who've been around the church, all that Jesus is predicting takes place. All of it actually happens. He is turned over to the chief priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They do judge him and condemn him. Then they do turn him over to the Romans. Pilate washes his hands. Barabbas is set free. Jesus is condemned. And then we go into the brutality of how they mock and scourge him. 
And I think that we only think about it at Easter time when we think about the, the sacrifice that Jesus did. But the brutality of the cross was not just the cross itself, but it was the mocking and the scourging before it. The absolute humili humiliation of the second person of the Trinity. Jesus Christ would be stripped nude, beaten with a whip, flesh torn from his body, bones being sharpened into his back. And I don't say that just to be graphic, but just to remind us of the absolute brutality of what this wrath poured out upon Jesus entailed. And it would be absolutely horrific to forget to witness, but to experience. Now, we know all these predictions would take place. Jesus is telling this to the disciples once again. This is the third time that they have heard it. And just, whoop, right over their heads once again. But don't get too arrogant in ourselves because we often don't catch it the first, the second, or the third time either. Or the fourth, or the fifth, or the sixth, or the seventh, if we're honest. So, the disciples still have lessons to learn. This horrifying prediction is missed by the apostles. And we miss things too. <clears throat> and so we must always return back to the gospel itself so that we might understand, so that we might grasp once again the significance and the importance of all of these aspects. We don't focus only on the brutality of the scourging and the beating <clears throat> and the brutality of the cross itself because Jesus finishes his prediction with the greatest statement of all time. On the third day, the Son of Man will rise up. And that's why we have the ability to claim the freedom of the gospel itself. But in order to do this, this takes us to our second point, we must be last like Christ. We have to be last. This is, if, if you've been paying attention these past several weeks, this is a reoccurring theme that keeps showing up paragraph after paragraph after paragraph after paragraph, this idea of being last. In the midst of Jesus thinking about and predicting uh, his death, pulling them aside as they're marching up to Jerusalem and, and telling them, you would think the disciples have caught, have understood, have heard about the brutality that is facing Jesus. But we find that Jesus, even though he's given this prediction, that the disciples are thinking of themselves, of how they can be great. Because in verse 20, <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Zebedee, Mama Zebedee, she gets her boys, comes over and starts having a conversation with Jesus. Now she bows humbly and submits before him, and, but she has a question for Jesus. In the other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, uh, it doesn't always include the mom coming with them, but we, but we know that, that in some semblance, mom was there, and mom brings a request, and the two sons bring the request as well. I can just imagine two mama's boys coming with their mama with a, with a request for Jesus, and they come over there thinking of themselves and Jesus is going to confront them, and he, he redirects them to show them what is, what is really great. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they wanted a place of prominence. They wanted a place of importance. And so their mom, well-meaning, I'm sure, wanted them to have a place of importance too. <clears throat> now, it's important for us to realize that in a, for a cultural context, for a Jewish person in this time period, like James and John, they would have come to this understanding that Jesus had come to usher in the kingdom of God. They were all under the impression that, that Jesus had come to overthrow an earthly kingdom and establish a new kingdom here on earth. And Jesus was trying to direct them all along to understand that Jesus was building a heavenly kingdom, that Jesus had to come to be the suffering lamb of God, that he might bring restoration to uh, the destruction that was caused in our rebellion. But they kept thinking Jesus is going to establish a kingdom here. So if Jesus is going to establish a kingdom, <coughs> they want to be on the right and on the left. They want to be in positions of prominence. So it would be, you know, maybe embarrassing to have their mom ask something on, on, on their behalf, but it doesn't appear that that's the case. No, they go right along with mama, and they want, <laughs> you know, they go up to Jesus. And think about the, the, the um, I, don't, I don't know if arrogance is the right word, but the, the assuming intention of coming to Jesus and be like, okay, when you're ruling in your kingdom, we want to sit on your right and your left. We want to be in the most important positions of prominence. So Miss Zebedee, she kneels down to show this respect, and he, she asks for this position of honor. And she had this idea of Jesus sitting on, on the throne and one brother on the right, one brother on the left. 
And, you know, Matthew, it's funny, Matthew's gospel shows us that Jesus doesn't even direct his answer towards mama. Because I don't know if these boys kind of talk mama into it or not. We don't have the full picture of it. But Jesus directs his answer to, instead, <coughs> to James and John. He speaks directly to them. And so they're all watching. They're all listening in. We're going to find out that all of the other disciples are around, too. There's other folks, evidently, because, you know, Mama Zebedee is there, so others are probably there. But Jesus doesn't go to the request specifically. Instead, he does something that, that, uh, that I'll be honest, oftentimes in my own life, I find it frustrating when somebody does this to me. But Jesus does it anyways, and, and you know, he's the son of God. He's, he's Jesus. He can do what he wants to do. But he answers their question with a question. You ever have somebody answer your question with a question? You're like, he didn't answer my question. But Jesus does that in this passage. He answers their question with a question. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? In the book of Mark, it also, it also adds a second line. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? It's two questions, but they have the same meaning that is behind them. They're giving the same indication. He, he's, he's got the, you know, he's, Jesus is like, do you know what you are asking? Do you know what you're asking for? Because this is a, that's a really big question. Jesus is talking about this cup that he's going to consume. The idea here is this, this drinking of this cup is, is the experiencing of something that is horrific, that is difficult, that is going to be painful, that inclu includes suffering. <clears throat> Jesus is going to be consuming the very wrath of God, the guilt of man, the punishment that we deserve, something difficult to swallow. When I was a child, um, very young child, we were living in New Hampshire. My brother and I shared a room. And uh, one day, my brother wasn't feeling too well, and so he asked me to get him something to drink, a cup of water. I said, sure, Cody, I'll get you a cup of water. And I went into the kitchen. I got out a cup, and I thought to myself, vinegar looks a lot like water. So I poured him a nice glass of vinegar. I take it to the room, and Cody turns up that cup of vinegar, and of course he spits it out, and I got in a wee bit of trouble, but it was, um, it was worth the laugh. It was, quite, it was quite amusing. But swallowing something that is harsh, that is caustic, that is difficult, this is the, the question that Jesus is asking when he says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And this cup is the, is the very wrath of God, the very you know, difficult aspect it is a dark and destructive thing that nobody can imagine. Jesus will consume the punishment. And the disciples, I think, without having the full knowledge and the full understanding and the full weight of what Jesus is saying, they say, yes, we are. And Jesus is patient with them. Jesus is slow with them. He is compassionate with them. And he doesn't say, you idiots. You don't have any idea what you are thinking. Instead, he begins to re-guide them. He says what it means is that they will suffer. And James would later be put to death and John would be exiled. All the disciples would die horrifically except for John being exiled. And so they would indeed take the wrath that Jesus took. One was crucified on an X. One was crucified upside down because they did not believe that they were worthy of being put to death in the same manner that Jesus was. Boiled to death. Beheaded. The, the worst possible executions that you could ever imagine. So yes, they did indeed walk the path. They did indeed drink this cup. But Jesus, at this time, was bringing them along to understand when they finally got to the place where they would indeed have to drink the cup that they were able to. But it took some teaching along the way, and we need some teaching along the way too. Because they don't yet know to what extent Jesus will suffer or the suffering that they will experience too. <coughs> Jesus does say that they will go through what he goes through to some extent. But it's plain to, to, he makes it plain to them, though, that uh, these places, these positions of honor, the right and the left hand, he says, look, you will suffer like I suffer. However, these positions that you seem, that you deem as prominent, they're not mine to give. They are God's to give. The truth that he shares, actually, it goes back to verses 1 through 16 when we looked at the parable of the vineyard. That is God's righteous prerogative to give grace to whomever he wants to give grace to and reward whom he, whomever he wants to reward. <clears throat> but James and John get this small glimpse 
that they will face a future like Jesus. And they let down, they're let down gently to understand that it's God's job to reward. That's not why Jesus is walking the earth at that time. He has come to suffer for sinners and drink the very wrath of God. And the other disciples, they find out what's going on with James and John. And um, here's what verse 24 says. Verse 24 says, And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. All right. The other ten disciples, they're around. They figure out. They hear what's going on. And they become indignant with James and John, the brothers. It's not a word that we use very often, indignant. So let me just, uh, you know, bring it down to a southern level. Them boys are ticked. They're mad. The other ten are beyond frustrated. Now, this is not righteous indignation. They're not mad because that, that you know that they're embarrassed that James and John, that these two brothers, ha, you know, have asked something so foolish because they're so much more mature, so pious and high and mighty in their understanding. No, they're mad because they didn't think of it first. They're frustrated because they didn't ask the question first about getting to sit in the positions of prominence. The disciples were not just angry because the brothers were being selfish. No, they're they're angry because they were jealous. They were envious. They wanted those spots themselves. And Jesus knew what was going on throughout all of this, and so he patiently and calmly teaches them a lesson. I, you know, it's, it's interesting because Jesus could have simply said, what is wrong with you? But instead, he brings them around. He could have said, did you not just hear that I said that I was going to suffer and die? And you're asking about positions of greatness. You're asking about being in an important spot. You're asking about being, you know, on my right and on my left. But Jesus doesn't do it that way. Instead, once again, he, re he, he redirects them and teaches them concerning how things ought to be. Verse 25, but Jesus called them to himself. I, I love that picture of Jesus calling them, calling them to himself. I can just imagine this, this master teacher saying, all right, guys, come on. Come, come gather around, and he just takes a seat on the mountainside, and he sits there, and he gently begins to communicate with them. And he's like, you know how the Gentiles are? You know how the Roman people are? You know how they have authorities and rulers and how they lord it over others? It's not going to be that way with you guys. That's not how it is in the kingdom of God. And we ought to be hearing that very clearly because that's not how it is for the church. That's not how it's supposed to be for the people of God. Jesus calmly brings them over and he begins to get, do a comparison and a contrast. He, he's saying, understand that it's not supposed to be that way. He's saying, we look at these earthly rulers and the things that they do. We look at them, <coughs> and we see that they try and seek greatness by being tyrants or having authority over others. They want prestige and power and influence and whatever it might be to get to the top. And that's still the way it is, pretty much, where people fight to get to the top to be first. And Jesus says this, it's not going to be that way among you. We are not to be like the world. We're not to seek prestige and power and influence. So then what are we supposed to seek? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because scripture tells us. <clears throat> Jesus says if you want to be great, you've got to be servants. You've got to be slaves to one another and to God. If we want to be first, you have to be a slave. We must lower ourselves and humble ourselves and put the needs of others before, our, before ourselves. Now, in your flesh, this is impossible. You can't do it on your own. It's impossible. But th this is the scriptural direction for what it means to, to be great. This, hey, church, listen to me this morning. Hear this very, very clearly. The Bible is giving us a very simple instruction this morning. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you serve the kingdom of God. You serve one another. Um, I have watched in my 42 years of life growing up, you know, from nine years old all the way till now being in church, I have watched a drift that has taken place so right in front of my face that is unbelievable. And this drift is, it used to be so commonplace for people to do three things on a Sunday morning. Attend a Sunday school class attend a worship service, 
and serve in some capacity. That was normative. I think <clears throat> that there's been a drift for many decades that that has begun to, to disappear. I think the drift was multiplied when COVID happened and it became just comfortable, I guess. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I think. Um, at my last church, I had a very large student ministry. I was the youth pastor there. And well, we had a whole bunch of students. There was a, there was a discussion that was taking place about you know um, during the summer, not having Wednesday night services and, and just letting people spend more time with their families. On the surface, that sounds good. That sounds all well and, and fine. The problem is with students, if they replace that time slot with something else, it'll be nearly impossible to win them back when the fall comes. And I think when COVID took place, it was a multiplying factor for people plugging into small groups and into areas of service within the church because it was replaced with other things and it's not come back. And the truth of the matter is, and I'll just flat out tell you, and, and if you get mad at me, that's fine. If you're embarrassed by it, fine. There are too many people in our church who come on a Sunday morning and that's all that they do. They never do anything besides attend a worship service. They're not in a small group. They're not serving any capacity. They're not doing anything to, to help any other ministry. And I'm like, look, just pick somewhere to serve. It doesn't matter what it is, just in some capacity. I don't care if it's God's helping hands or if you're helping with the bus ministry or, or what, whatever it is, the nursery or, or a want, whatever it is, find some place to serve. And Jesus is flat out saying here that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, if you want to be obedient in the kingdom of God, you are serving one another. You're serving the kingdom of God. This is in plain and simple. It's right on the page. It comes with humility and service. So we ought to be seeking humility and service so that we can be like Christ. To be great, we must serve. <clears throat> Jesus is daring his followers to, to do this, to be great. And he's, he's sandwiching this commandment this for us right between his two proclamations of death. So we're, we're last like Christ. We serve like Christ. We're last like Christ. And finally, we serve like Christ. Jesus, the great one, came not only to suffer but to serve. And he would serve in the greatest way by his suffering. By explaining his own suffering, Jesus is establishing the standard by which we measure what it means to serve. Look at verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. A ransom for many. What is a ransom? When you think about it, a ransom is this. It's a payment. It's an exchange. It's when there are prisoners. It's when there are hostages. It's when somebody is captured and a ransom must be paid. The Son of Man did not come to be served. He did not come as a king to be served. He could have. He, he is the, the, the great one. He could have come in that way. No, but instead he came to serve. And what was his service? It was to pay the ransom for you and me. He was the ransom payment. His blood was the ransom payment. What an what a unbelievable picture. Jesus is telling the disciples and, and all of his followers that, that becoming great happens by serving. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve others. If anyone ever deserved to be served, it would be Jesus himself. I mean, right? Who deserves more to be served than anyone else? Jesus. And yet he says that he came to serve. He came with the chief purpose of serving us. And he would demonstrate this by giving his life as a ransom, as the payment for many. The price to be paid to buy something back. Those of us who were slaves to sin, it was the price to buy us back. Jesus paid the price. Jesus died as a ransom for us. He willingly laid down his own life. He did not have to. He could have wiped out everyone with a blink of an eye, with a snap of his fingers, but instead he took on the role of a suffering servant, humiliation, even to the point of death on a cross, laying down his own life. What a sacrifice. What servanthood. Hear me, church, this morning. That's our model. That's what we're to look to. That's what we are just, now we're not going to, you're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and be Jesus. Just so you know, this is not going to happen. But it's our goal to serve like that. We, we become great by serving and by sacrificing. We want to be like Jesus, then we be a servant. Now, this is not our natural tendency. In our very own flesh, we are not, we don't have the tendency to say, yeah, you go first. Yeah, you have what's best. 
Yes, your needs before mine. That's not normative for us. But when the Spirit of God comes alongside of us and we begin to grow and understand more in depth about the Word of God, then our obedience reflects this service. So we look more like Jesus. That's why Jesus came, to suffer and to serve, that we might be ransomed from the curse of sin. He came to give us new life and and a new way to live, the way he created us rather than the way the world lives. And that is done in the power of God. So we think of ways we can love the church by serving. Part of the the vision that we have here for the church is, is to develop disciples who are growing and maturing. And the only means by which that takes place is if people are not only listening to the word of God, but seeking to be obedient to the word of God. So there's going to be suffering in your journey, and there ought to be service in your journey. So look for a way to love the church by serving the church in some shape, form, or fashion. Find some role that you can serve in the church. If we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, then we have to serve one another, serving the kingdom of God. And so think of ways that you can. And think about, you know, serving others. I, I have lots of times where, where people, you know, feel like they, they need pastoral, you know, permission to serve other people. If you see a need and you can meet the need, you're a believer in Christ. You're just called to do that. I mean, that, to be frank, you know, well, you know, Joe and, and Mo and Joe don't have, you know, any food in the refrigerator. Okay, well, go to the grocery store and put some food in the refrigerator. I mean, if you can meet the need, you see the need, then meet the need. That, that's what, the way we're called to serve one another, not just the, the church, but to serve each other. We're called to love one another within the church, and we're called to love those outside the church as well. And so look for ways to serve one another. And think about how we can do all of this <coughs> in obedience. And the final thing that I want us to hear is to to recognize this is understand that it's not always going to be easy and oftentimes it will be hard. It's not always going to be easy and oftentimes it will be hard. Serving requires sacrifice and sometimes sacrifice requires suffering. And even though many prominent preachers don't talk much about it today, suffering is a normal part of a believer's life. When they're seeking to be obedient, Sometimes serving requires suffering. And, you know, James and John and all the other disciples, they would take part in suffering. He's calling us, too, as well, to recognize that sometimes we'll have to suffer. It may lead to, to, to suffering in our sacrifice. But he's calling us to faithfulness that sometimes leads us into suffering. So take some time in these closing moments as we reflect upon the word of God to see the, the suffering and the serving in our life, realizing that greatness is found in that. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you can be. You can be made new because of the the suffering and the service of Jesus Christ who came to pay a ransom for many. That payment's been made. He gave his life so that you could be ransomed from the curse of sin. So you just respond to the the gospel by believing that he is indeed the Son of God, confessing with your mouth that he is Lord, turning away from your sin, and trusting in his righteousness. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the suffering servant that was your son the Holy One who came to exchange himself for us. God, we thank you for that great exchange. And God, as we submit ourselves to your word this morning, we see that we too must walk in a path of suffering at times. And God, we also see that we're called to serve. My prayer is that each one of us will be convicted by the Spirit of God to to find some capacity for, for service to the church, to the kingdom of God, and to each other. And God, this morning, as we pause for just a moment, we ask ourselves, what now? God, I pray that you write upon our hearts where each and every one of us needs to to repent, need to to reconnect with our journey of seeking to serve one another. God, we ask you to do a work in us this morning. In Jesus' name.
thank you for worshiping with us today. My prayer is that you go from this place, take the word of God, and let it be written upon your heart. God loves you, and we do too. Have a good afternoon.